this panel, as I think you all know, is on mature learners, covering a report that Tezo is delighted to publish uh, today. Uh, just as a quick reminder, you're all attendees, except for the panelists. That means you cannot speak or uh, cannot use your video. Uh, that also saves you from any uh, accidents uh, by uh, from being on the video. Um, but I, we do want to encourage discussion. Uh, so if you do want to ask questions, please use the Q&A function. Do not use the chat function. You can use the chat function if you want uh, to chat with, with friends or anyone you know, or to let us know any concerns about the tech. But if you have specific questions about the panel, please use the Q&A function. We will not be looking at the chat function uh, for questions. So without any further ado, I will hand over to my colleague, Dr. Eliza Cosman, uh, Tezio's Deputy Director uh, for Research. Brilliant, thank you, Omar. Um, so great to be here today. As Omar says, I'm Eliza Cosman, Deputy Director of Research at Teso. I look after the research and evaluation program. Um, this session is titled Supporting and Extending Opportunities for Mature Students in Higher Education. As Omar said, we launched a report on this today. If you haven't seen it, please do take a look at our website and, and have a read. I hope you'll find it really interesting, but really delighted to have this panel to supplement that launch with an active discussion on the day of its publication. I think there are some really interesting links to some of the discussion that's already happened this morning as well. So for those of you who were able, able to join previous sessions, hopefully this will kind of, uh, there'll be some nice threads of continuity throughout. So I'm going to briefly introduce our panel. Each uh, speaker will have about eight minutes to present their thoughts on this topic. Then I will ask a few questions as chair's prerogative before we hand over to Q&A. And as Omar says, just please, please put the questions in the Q&A. Uh, box otherwise I won't be able to see them. So with no further ado to introduce our panel, uh, first we have Susanna Hume. Susanna is Director of Evaluation in the Policy Institute at King's College London and in this capacity she also served from January 2019 through to June 2020 as establishing director of TESO. So she knows us as an organization very well and she's author on the report which is launched today which she will be talking about. Uh, professor John Butcher uh, is a Professor of Inclusive Teaching in Higher Education at the Open University and he's responsible for the university's UK-wide access programme. He's Deputy Director on the Open programme uh, and leads the Access Observatory as well. Uh, and Stephen Akpabia Klementowski is our Mature Student Representative. He has a remarkable journey uh, which has taken him from being a prisoner to an Open University student and now to an OU member of staff uh, supporting students in the Secure Environments team. And he actually achieved his OU degree and two master's degrees uh, from Oxford Brooks while serving his prison sentence. So we're really pleased to have Stephen with us today. Um, and so with the introductions complete, I'm going to hand over promptly to Susanna for her opening remarks for around eight minutes. Thanks, Eliza. And it's wonderful to be to be back in the Teso family. And I really enjoyed the first half of the conference or the first half of today. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to follow that with some suitably interesting comments on the research that we've done. So I'm going to attempt to synthesize the two kind of strands of this research, the first of which was the evidence review, which was most which looked at the existing evidence that we were able to source via either academic strands or sort of via publicly available grey literature. Uh, looking at both initiatives that currently exist to support mature students and, you know, to the extent that they've been evaluated, and then uh, the, the much more richer kind of vein of research we found, which was trying to understand the experience of mature students and the barriers that uh, adults might face to joining an institution to enrolling in, in higher education as a mature student. The second strand, which was very much born out of the first strand, we, uh, was a survey experiment. Uh, and in this experiment, basically what we what we did was what's known as a conjoint experiment, where you show a series of comparisons between two hypothetical options, uh, where you randomly vary the attributes. Uh, and then you ask people to pick which of the two options <coughs> they would be more likely to choose. Uh, and, and because you've randomly varied the attributes, what you start to get is an understanding of how a particular attribute contributes overall to the likelihood that someone is going to choose an option. So the attributes in this experiment were the institutional ranking. Uh, what we said was travel time from where you live, which we framed as 
in a time, not a distance to allow, you know, people to have their own kind of modes of travel, course size, class timing, which was outside during or a mixture of work of both with working uh, working hours, weekdays, uh, student satisfaction, proportion of graduates in a graduate job after 12 months, the proportion of students on the course who were mature students, the availability of online or blended learning. And then we had a subset, which was uh, support available for mature students, which was academic skills training, dedicated mature student support, staff member, nursery or childcare available, and then social opportunities. And what, what we showed people was course A and course B, and which had a kind of random attributes on, on each of those factors within, within parameters. And then we asked them which course they preferred. And we did that with 2,500 adults without an HE qualification. Uh, and they each saw five comparisons. They each saw five sets of options. Uh, and so, as I said, what our goal was here was basically to infer which features of a particular course appeal most to people. And this is partly to get around the challenge where, first of all, most of the existing literature is on people who are, is with people who are already in education. And so then we have to assume that the barriers they've overcome are the same barriers that other people are facing. Uh, and second of all, that people sometimes uh, aren't very good at accurately reporting what has driven a preference or a decision. And this is a flawed but slightly different angle to take on trying to and trying to understand what will drive people's preferences. Uh, so I'm going to cover the sort of themes of it across three areas. The first is the sort of general institutional factors. The second is around the sort of flexibility and convenience of the offer. And the third is around belonging as a mature learner. All of these came out sort of in the literature review, and then we picked them up in the attributes in the survey experiment. So the first thing to say is that overall, everyone preferred higher ranked institutions, which didn't really come up in the literature review at all. Um, and sort of broadly speaking, a gap in relative ranking between the two options uh, of about 50 places in, you know, whichever ranking you, you, you know, prefer to think of it as we didn't specify, uh, is roughly as strong an influence on someone's preferences as a gap in travel time of about 45 minutes. Um, and I'll get to travel time in a moment. So mature students are willing to consider longer commutes for higher in ranked institutions, but within reason, basically. Uh, under 25s were particularly responsive to graduate outcomes and likewise course satisfaction. Uh, everyone was moderately interested in it, but under 25s were particularly interested. And then course, so course size, smaller courses were relatively weakly preferred across the board. Uh, the kind of disapproval of larger course sizes was relatively steeper from kind of 10 to 250, and then it sort of flattened out. So sort of over 20, 250 was just kind of a big course and people weren't that responsive to increments there. Uh, in terms of the second theme around flexibility and in institutional structures, the evidence review suggested really strongly that convenience, flexibility and childcare were really important for mature learners and the survey experiment broadly agreed. Uh, so the likelihood of picking a course decreased strongly as travel time increased. This was weaker for under 25s, but everybody basically was much more inclined to pick the near a course to the further course uh, and the further away they were the stronger that effect was. Uh, the interestingly under 25s those on lower household incomes and those with qualifications of level two or below were pretty indifferent to the availability of out of hours provision whereas those with the kind of level three or above qualification and older uh, respondents were more attracted to the availability of out of hours provision which I think you could you could sort of uh, have some theories about why that would be. Uh, everybody was very interested in online and blended learning. We only asked this as a yes, no question. So it's yes, it's available or no, it isn't. Uh, we asked people to pretend that we weren't in these COVID times, uh, but we can't uh, eliminate the role of that. Uh, having seen how strongly this has come through, it, it was a very big catch all category that we used there. And I think there is lots of scope for more research on which bits of online and blended learning people are particularly looking for. And then lastly, somewhat unsurprisingly, childcare availability was more attractive to those who had children currently, uh, broadly attractive to those under the age of 45, after which not very attractive, and more attractive to more qualified respondents. So those at level three or above as opposed to level two or below. 
And then the third area, which I think is particularly interesting, is around belonging as a mature learner and support available for mature learners specifically. So the evidence review suggested that this was quite important, the sort of identity of experience of being a mature learner in an institution, especially one where most people are 18 to 20 years old. How do you kind of fit that in with your other identities as an adult who's had a job, who might have a family, all of those sorts of things. Uh, the survey experiment, I think, was quite interesting on this because respondents were kind of indifferent to the opportunity to network with other mature students. So it, it was one of the only things here that didn't really swing their preferences either way. Um, but they did weekly prefer courses with a higher proportion of mature students. So the fact that there will be other mature students in the course was attractive to people. Um, and they were quite responsive to a bundle of features that I think suggest that the institution is invested in supporting mature students. So childcare and flexibility, but also respondents preferred courses where there was a specific academic uh, support for mature students and or the presence of a mature student support officer. So things that suggest the institution has invested in attracting and supporting this cohort. Uh, the mature student support officer was less interesting to under 25s who overall behaved more similarly to uh, 18 year olds, we suspect we didn't have any in the sample, but they behaved more similarly to your conventional learners. Uh, and very much more so for those with level two or below qualifications who were very attracted to the presence of a support officer to support them. So just as some sort of final thoughts. So there's very little research on non-enrollers, on people who haven't engaged with higher education. And so it was great to be able to fill, to sort of go into that gap. However, there's a big gap between preferring one option over another and actually enrolling in a course. Uh, the survey environment is quite artificial and the diversity of the sample matches cl more closely to the diversity of the population rather than the mature learner population. So. Uh, white people, white respondents are overrepresented in our survey sample relative to the mature learner population. Uh, and as I said before, I think, you know, given how strongly blended and online came through, more research needs to be done there. Um, and then I wanted to end with a comment on the experiment itself, actually. So for this experiment, we used a platform called Prolific, which is an online survey panel. Uh, once we said you had to be 18, 18 or over and you had to not have a qualification already or not be studying. We had 6,000 eligible respondents. And we had a survey that was basically about opportunities to continue your education. And so we were slightly concerned that we would struggle to recruit. Uh, we wanted what 2,000, and in the end, we launched the survey at 7.30 p.m. one day, and by 10 a.m. the next day, we'd had 2,500 people sign up to do this survey. And one respondent in one of the open feedback forms wrote, I don't think about furthering my education often, but I have today, thank you. And so I wanted to end just on the point that we sometimes encounter a belief that there's no point trying to re-engage adults with education, that once people are out of schooling, it's difficult or impossible to sort of trigger people to consider improving their skills. However, the study, I think, is a timely reminder that there are many people who are or could be interested in HE that we need to seek out, understand and support. There's a lot to do on this so that all HEIs pull their weight in supporting people's lifelong learning journey. Uh, and, you know, I'm excited for TESO to be working in this space and working towards making that a reality. Excellent. Thank you so much, Susanna. Really helpful overview of the report results and, and your, your reflections on it. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to John uh, for his eight minutes. Thank you ever so much, Eliza. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I just discovered that my I was hearing better without my headphones than with my headphones. So there we are, the wiles of Zoom calls. Um, thank you. And thank you to Taso for inviting me to do this. So I, I work at the Open University. I'm privileged to work at the Open University. And I say that seriously because I think we have a um, long-term social justice mission to be open to all. Therefore, we have as our core business, really, working with adult learners. And I'm very conscious that that's not necessarily core business for every other university. So it's worth just thinking about that. Um, the Open University retains its open access approach. So a student can sign up for an OU qualification, um, regardless of what previous qualifications they have. And we aim to attract students at scale returning to learning. So this is our core business really. But I'm also manage, manage, managing editor of the journal Widening Participation and Lifelong Learning. So 
I, I'm fully aware of kind of UK and international perspectives on widening participation. So I'm going to um, reflect back on my own research. I'm going to draw out seven headlines, really, that I hope will help us in this conversation, just to situate the problem. But I'm just going to start with two, I think, quite important contextual points. First of all is what, what do we mean by adult learners? The um, Higher Education Statistics Agency defines mature, which is often used as a proxy for adult learner and used interchangeably, as someone over the age of 21. And I think we can all see what a broad church that is. We, we include their commuter students, students living at home, students who are earning while they're learning, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we have to have quite a broad notion of what we're talking about today. Um, secondly, is the quantitative data on the decline or the challenges facing adult learning is very well reported. Um, we, we know that uh, many adult students can only study part-time and that the vast majority of part-time students are adults. So there's a kind of proxy going on there. And since the fees rose in England in 2012, there's been about a 60% reduction in the number of part-time learners in higher education. That's really, really significant. And that actually reflects if you include those invisible part-time learners, a 17% reduction in students from disadvantaged backgrounds enrolled in undergraduate study, which is not what some government pronouncements would lead you to believe at certain times of the year, but I'll leave that dangling. This to me suggests um, a bit of a, a policy failure, arguably a market failure, but I, I look to the, um, the Nobel laureate economist Robert Schiller, who argues that people's actions are based on human stories rather than hard data. So my first message really is we really need to listen to the voices of adult learners to understand better what to do about this and to make for effective policy. So seven headlines from me. First of all, age amplifies disadvantage. Many adult learners will fall into the same sort of characteristics shared by students from so-called widening participation backgrounds. So for example, they may, they may suffer economic deprivation, they may come from low participation areas, they may experience disability or chronic health problems, they may arrive with low or alternative entry qualifications. So this is really a, a key part, I think, of intersectional disadvantage. And I think policymakers need to better understand that to inform the kind of interventions we might wish to make. Um, secondly, uh, compared to conventional widening participation approaches, adult learners are very hard to reach. One can think about the millions of pounds spent on school-based outreach, but wh where would we expect to find adult learners? They'll be in their communities, they'll be in their workplaces, they'll be caring for others very, very difficult to target. Um, and unlike conventional um, school-based pupils moving into higher education, their learning journeys will often be very indirect. Uh, they'll, be, they'll take kind of random cul-de-sacs. They'll, they'll be uh, rather ad hoc and disjointed in their pathways. They'll stop and then they'll start again. And each adult learner journey will be unique. So. I think a crucial thing here is that adult learners cannot be treated either by policymakers or universities as a homogeneous group. Thirdly, I think there's a dissonance between policy and practice in this space. There's some very welcome rhetoric around the participation of adults, but it seems to me a practical vacuum. Uh, very recently, I've been responding to an Office for Students consultation on the funding of outreach. And they asked some perfectly reasonable questions to which we spent a lot of time replying. Um, it felt like they retained a very narrow misunderstanding about where adult learners are to be found. And they seemed preoccupied with finding them already existing in further education colleges. Some will certainly be there, but lots of prospective students won't. And I do, I, I am concerned that the kind of levers that we have at our disposal, for example, our access and participation plans, despite exhortations by the OFS, 
still fail to target adults. So I wonder if this kind of engagement could be mandated. Fourthly, I just want to reflect upon the kind of barriers identified in the widening participation literature as long ago as 2006 by Stephen Gorada's colleagues. And he, he divided them up into three criteria really. And I think these are very relevant to our adult learners. First of all, the dispositional barriers. So adults returning to higher education or turning to higher education experience generally a, a culture shock. They're very disoriented. They've often carried for years a very negative previous experience of learning, perhaps from their school-based education. Their confidence is vulnerable. They're easily knocked back by disappointing grades. And so they really need a particular approach to support and tuition that I think we don't always think about quite enough. So there are real implications there for teaching approaches which can be denied, uh, designed in. Um, fifthly, the situational barriers. So um, it is a fact that adults are likely to be more time poor than younger students. Their studies are easily disrupted by life events, so they need flexibility. They're also much more likely to be debt averse. They fear the perceived cost of higher education, which they many will regard as a risky investment, and so they need to perceive HE as affordable. Sixthly, are kind of institutional barriers. So um, I, I would argue all universities simply need to be far more adult learner sensitive. They need flexible timetabling, they need flexible assessment deadlines, they need clear information advice and guidance for the quite complex qualification progression pathways, but that pedagogy can be designed in to be inclusive. So uh, many universities will have uh, preparatory or bridging modules. I think this is a good step forward. They, they will embed the development of studentship skills. I've seen particularly good examples where community stakeholders have been included in the development of those bridging courses. And also I think important to think about to take the learning where the adults are. Traditionally, that would have been in the community. Now, I think with digital, which we've heard about already, I think there are lots of opportunities to do more of that. And finally, my seventh bit of learning is, uh, I, it must be my age, I think. I used to get really, really annoyed in this space and want a revolution. Perhaps now we just need an evolution. And I think that is about building and implementing on some smart practice and policy that is already out there. So. I reflect back on the AUGA recommendations. Um, it's been a bit kicked into the long grass or the, the middle length grass recently, but AUGA re recommended flexible learning, recommended bridging courses, recommended financial support for adults, and all of which speak to me of institutions and policymakers avoiding the danger of defaulting to assumptions that all students are 18 years old and want to leave home. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, John. Um, really helpful to have that checklist of reflections for us. Um, I'm gonna pass straight over to Stephen uh, for his comments. Hi, thank you, Faiza. Uh, and thank you, John, um, for that. Uh, and um, thank you, uh, Tassel, for, for inviting me. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here today. And I've been, I, I um, unfortunately couldn't join you this morning, but I'm absolutely fascinated uh, from the little snippets I've just gleaned about um, your discussions earlier, because they seem, they seem pertinent. Right, so, <clears throat> so my name is Steve Nakarapantowski. I am um, a, a regional manager for uh, the European University Students in Secure Environments team, um, so I'm responsible for about 29 prisons and secure hospital units in the country. Um, my role essentially is to facilitate um, or you study in these institutions and establishments. So that's one of the roles I have. I'm also an associate lecturer uh, with the, again, with the OU, I, associate lecturer in criminology. Um, and I'm also a visiting lecturer at the University of Westminster, which is something I've picked up very well recently. Uh, and to top it all, I am um, actually um, currently involved in my own research. Uh, my research uh, focuses on prison education. Um, and um, I mean, I'm in the final year of doing that now, and uh, 
it's interesting actually because what brought me to wanting to look at um, prison education, specifically higher education prisons, um, is this idea. Uh, well, it, it's actually through my own experience of, of the criminal justice system. So, so a bit of background before going to university, I, I actually went to prison. I had left school with no qualifications. I left school. 14, 15, and um, I didn't return to, I didn't return to any kind of learning, any kind of education, formal or informal, until the age of 34, whilst I was serving a prison sentence. And um, what I think the first thing to say is that the is that the Open University's widening access program, the ethos of open access, literally stands out for me. Uh, and the reason it does is because it, I, I think um, it, it really does demonstrate, we've talked about social responsibilities and so on, social corporate responsibility, but it does demonstrate an, an understanding of social problems, social issues, and, and trying to get down to the roots of it. And in my, you know, in my opinion, and certainly in my area in criminology, most of it actually comes down to education, giving people the right skills and abilities so that they can go on and, and make a positive contribution to the society. That's really, in many cases, what you come down to. So, so I left school with no qualifications. And when I arrived in, in, in prison, um, one of the things I really was conscious about was the revolving door syndrome. Um, and so that means essentially where people come in, serve their time and leave. And um, of course, where you don't have, um, as I found, uh, where you don't have the right skills, where you don't have um, transferable skills, qualifications that you know employers be interested in. It means, in you know, in terms of trying to make a living and put food on the table for family, that, that there's not, you know, there are not many options. So it's actually really important in terms of ensuring mm -hmm. that that prisoners, not just prisoners, that everybody has a second opportunity really to 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 to. to um, to gain the qualification, uh, the, skill, uh, the education that they may not have had an opportunity to gain uh, uh, as young people. Um, and I found that in prison. So the Open University currently have over 1,600 students in secure environments, and that's prisons and, um, um, and, and secure hospital units. Now, 1,600 is a lot of students, and they, 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 it's right across the range. So from undergraduate study to postgraduate study, we have students in particular environments, in prisons, engaging at this level. And what that tells me, and sort of reaffirms my own my own experience, is the idea that 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 adults um, will, will 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 you know will approach the future in a you know in a pragmatic way. In a rational way, that adults will, will will look to see ways that can improve them, you know, improve their circumstances, improve improve outcomes for themselves going forward. And I think it's it, you know, the motivation is there. What is lacking often is is the support networks that's required to 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 to, to, to work with these students and see them through. So, um, the Open University has got a, a really amazing understanding specifically working in prisons and I've put in the right support structure that enable um, that enables these students to, and prisoners to go on and, and, and gain their qualifications and so just looking at it from sort of my own personal experience having had that huge gap and having had that negative experience um, at school um, and just thinking about my emotions and what ran through my mind um, in, in 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 talking about in talking in talking about um, you know the opportunities that the Open University offered as I was in custody at the time the only university that actually did that um, you know so I thought well well first and foremost I had to earn the opportunity you know I had to earn the eligibility to actually be an OU student so I had to make sure that I gained my GCSEs and my level twos as as was required as part of that program so so that was in itself that got me started and I did do that and, and, and once I had completed that. Really, the prospects of, of of going to university is quite different from sort of doing my A, you know, some doing A levels. The thing about so we use this word education, and it means different things to different people. It scared the hell out of me when I heard it because I had such a negative experience with it. But you talk about learning, and you talk about you know, you talk about it in different ways. Then you know, one is a little bit more comfortable with it. So when you talk about sort of A levels and that sort of traditional route through to university, it just frightened the hell out of me, and I really wasn't interested in that because I thought I passed that. 
you know, I'm 30, I think it was four at the time, five. Yeah. So, but when it, you know, but the idea then um, of, 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 of working, talking about online and blended learning, the idea of being able to, 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 to learn in that way, not necessarily subject to being in a classroom uh, with you know, younger people and things like that was quite, was more attractive. So, so that in itself was, was attractive. But also, I think one of the, I, I, I often say um, that perhaps the, the biggest, the greatest barrier was my, it was just me. And, 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 and um, I, I think we call, we, we've talked about this as dispos dispositional barriers. And, uh, and um, in my research, which I've just completed, where I've case studied um, 18 former prisoners who were engaging, um, who were engaging HE while they were in custody, it comes through as well that, that, that um, you know, being, low on confidence and having that negative perception of our own academic ability you know it's never been tested because we you know so we all left school um without gaining any qualifications so we've never really had the opportunity to actually to actually put our ability to the test and um and once we have we realize hey actually we can cope with this with, with this stuff um so there's that negative perception and then that's where your tutors come in that's where the, that's where the support next network comes in that's where the university comes in in terms of its policies and how we how it supports these students i mean john mentioned something earlier about your about your grades as your you know your, your first assignments, the second assignments. I mean, as a, as a lecturer, as, as an associate lecturer now, I, I'm fully aware of that and I make sure that I don't, that I don't scare my students off, um, at, you know, at the very first attempt. Because think, it does take, I mean, I was fortunate to have a, a very inspiring tutor, Dr. McMahon was my first tutor. It was amazing because he, he engaged me at a level, never felt that sort of hierarchical, he's with power and knowledge and everything and I'm not, because he did, approach and treat me as if I had something to contribute. <laughs> um, and so I think it's important that how we support these students once they should, once we read your heads, I think they need the, we should be there to support them. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's what I have to say about it. Um, I think negative, I think low self, you know, this negative perceptions about academic ability. Um, I think low visibility of, of of certainly in terms of you know uh, BAME, low visibility of of of, of uh, 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 professionals, BM, you know BAME professionals as lecturers, as tutors, as professors, um, you know where you you know you're looking and they are not really there. Those sorts of issues, but ultimately for for students generally, I think it, or mature students generally, I think it's knowing that the support will be there. So you do you, so you do need to. Be quite explicit about. I think John again did mention some support workers, this identify in, identifiable individual who you you could go to to get that kind of support. But I think those are the sorts of things that really need to be put in place. And thank you. That's all I have to say. That's brilliant. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and I'm sure that stimulated lots of questions uh, from the audience. If I can just encourage you, so we'll put them in the, uh, the, the Q&A box and we'll come to them in just a minute. So make sure you get your questions in now, then I will triage them um, and, and we'll answer them. Um, but I have a few quest questions to kick us off. Um, and I think we've covered quite a, a range of different issues. My first one, I suppose, is around the evidence landscape. So today, this is a new piece of evidence. It's a pretty innovative method. It's, it's a, answering slightly different questions to what already exists. But looking across the piece, um, where do you think we need to see more research and evaluation? Where are the biggest remaining gaps where we need to be looking next and producing more and better evaluation, particularly in, in, in the sector? And I'll go to John first on that. Um, thank you, Lisa. I, I think it's I think it's very difficult because I think as part of the problem is a lot of the research has been done on notions of, of widening participation with younger people and aspiration raising and attainment raising. And, and I'm certainly not going to knock that, but it's not the kind of work that, that reaches, as it were, adult learners. And, and I think I think the challenge is, uh, as, as I implied, um, uh, that there are a, a remarkably heterogeneous bunch and in a sense they're they're not where the universities are that's the whole point really so I think the universities have to be much more outward looking um, and I think it's it's interesting that a, a piece of work I did for offer in the days before the office for students um, we found some really innovative work at, at, at Russell Group universities so at Leeds 
um, and at Bristol, who had some really radical work going on in their working class, local, ethnically diverse communities around the university with, with local people living there who didn't dream in a million years that they could go to their local university. People talked about uh, Bristol being, oh, you know, it's, it, it's up on the hill, you know, geographically, symbolically, it was, it was very apart from them. And I think what, what they did, they, they, they worked very closely with the community and, and took the learning to where the students were and developed pathways in. And those pathways were very um, uh, um, well received, but there remained a challenge when the students then progressed into those conventional university studies, when the university still felt alien, the students still felt like imposters, and they still weren't really geared up for adult learners. Um, I think I'd like to ask a little bit more about that in a second and also get Stephen's reflections. Um, but, but first, Susanna, did you have any reflections on the kind of next steps and big gaps for, for follow-up research? Uh, yeah, so I completely agree with John, that where where WP is in general is quite a long way from where you know mature sort of widening participation with mature learners needs to be. Um, and I think the benefit that WP with young learners has is that there is a lot of research on school children or school students uh, and their kind of aspirations and their expectations, which is basically your entire kind of latent cohort. So you can then see, you can then understand not only the people who do successfully go to university, but the people who don't and what the differences are. And, you know, we were sort of trying to start to get to that with this survey experiment, which was with people who aren't engaged in higher education. But I think that piece of understanding, you know, um, which is sort of classic survivorship bias issue where if all of the research is on the people you can reach, you just you don't know how much that represents the experiences and the challenges of the people you can't reach. Uh, and and so I think there, there is a, there's a big piece of, of, I think, sort of intellectual, theoretical, empirical work to be done there on, on uh, widening participation among mature learners that, that needs to be less reliant on the widening participation among uh, young learners cohort, but also needs to move beyond understanding the experiences of those who are already in HE towards understanding those, the, the experience of that kind of larger latent group. And just following on from that, do you have any advice for HE providers looking to evaluate their current work in this area? Uh, what do you think they should be aspiring to, to do to, to bolster the evidence base in that regard? Yeah, so I think, I mean, so interestingly, this the survey experiment model that we used, the sort of conjoint experiment, it actually originally came from the marketing literature. And, you know, it used to be, they used to use it to compare like, you know, mobile phones or restaurants or that sort of thing. But, not, but I think that that goes to a, a sort of important point here, which is that uh, universities marketing functions, actually, there is there is a certain amount of evaluation skill and capacity that is built into that because A-B testing, which is basically a randomized controlled trial, is, is you know, exists in most marketing platforms. Most people with the qualifications in marketing actually learn how to do that in their degree and as professionals. And, and the ability to kind of turn that towards innovation and experimentation and understanding more about reaching, uh, reaching the sort of people who would be interested in higher education if it was presented to them in the right way at the right time and with the right sort of bundle of support, I think is really, really sort of underutilized at the moment. Which is a variety from, you know, usually I go to these things and I say, go and find an academic who's interested and they'll help you. But now I'm saying, go and find a marketer. <laughs> I wonder if we have any marketing colleagues on the call um, who would uh, pick that up and run with it. And uh, John, you may have reflections on that from an AU perspective as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree. There's certainly lots of expertise and, and certainly our, our marketing colleagues have, have um, sought out adults who are not yet in higher education to, to explore with them. But I think I, I, I make a, a serious point here that um, the the what, what we learn, I think, by speaking to current adult learners is that they were they they were excited about the possibility of higher education often by a peer they met someone on the bus who turned around to them and said oh there's a crash at the local college when you need a crash and that if you do a course you might get it for nothing or or, or there's um 
there's someone in their community who looks and sounds like them who said, well, I've started that um, access module or whatever it is. So I think with, with adult learners, uh, and it's really difficult to, to do this at scale, but I think it's the, the, the listening to the individual voices and how they overcome those challenges is going to help universities to understand what to do, perhaps rather more than conventional large scale uh, marketing type approach. Hmm. Stephen, I can see you uh, wanting to come in there. Are you on meet? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I, I did. I did want to just jump in there because that was that, that's that's exactly right, John. That's absolutely right. Um, so we we would we so as, as um, the students environment team with the OU, we do exactly that. We take we take we take our learning to our students in, in prisons, and um, and one of the key things that we do is um, is this outreach in prison. So we'd go in um, and would organize an event and we would we would just be there with all our material and all the information and advice anyone would need um, to enable them to engage and have people who never thought about um, 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 going to university coming along and having a chat and then and, and, and within 20 minutes signing up to, 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 to join because they because they, they either have um, they either through the conversation recognize that um, but there's a lot of support in place for them. Recognize, I think we did talk about the ranking of the institution and the Open University um, is high up there. And, um, and so, and we know that our materials are, are, are brilliant. I thought at different universities now, um, and indeed your material, the way you present knowledge um, can, can play a role in all of this. So, but I think the critical thing is talking to people. It's, it's the opportunity for people to talk to you and for you to talk to potential, you know, potential students. Because um, for many people, certainly for for most prisoners, um, it, you know, going to university is not is wouldn't be the first thing on their list. Um, but once they have that opportunity to actually engage, and uh, and they engage with somebody who perhaps. They can they, they they make a connection with they can recognise either from the community or their friend or met on the bus they use, you know whatever it might be is to have a conversation going I think that's quite the effect, that's the effect, most effective way of going about it. And, and just to follow up on that, Stephen, because we had um, Susanna's talked about this sense of belonging in in the report, and then John also talked about culture shock, and I think you, you touched on this as well. So once um, mature adult learners are within an HE uh, provider, what do you think providers can do to optimise their experience and make sure they get the most out of their studies uh, and alleviate that culture shock? Well, well, I think it's all about being made to feel part of part of something. Um, I'm, I mean, the opposite is the case where. You know, you know, people study in isolation either through because it's distant learning. But ultimately, what happens is that you, you know, you, you cross this threshold in your own mind where you feel right. You know what? I'm actually becoming. I'm actually at university. Well, I'm, I'm doing the course. It might be an access module. It might be foundation. Whatever it is. But you are a student at a university, and that takes some understanding like, for people who don't just have the right to it. You know. Um, many people, uh, they, they, you know, they'd be the first perhaps in the family who are going to university and things like that. You know, so, so it does need to register upstairs that like you're actually there, you're in. Now, once you're in, you need to feel part of it. Uh, if you're alienated because of the language that's used or because of the various, you know, the various cliques that there might be. Um, so it's, 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 to, it's to get, it's to get, um, it's to get students to get involved, to have a sense that they're, that they're, their, country, their presence there is valuable because we're asking them for their opinions and we're asking them for what they think about stuff. So it's it's through it's it's not it's not just getting them through getting them in through the door. They're in through the door now, but where we now have to actually engage them, but engage them in their own you know on their terms, not in a sort of top down approach. Type thing. It's allowing them to be able to to to, to get involved. Um, with very it doesn't have to be even you know um, it doesn't have to be subject related they can get engaged in the organization of them you know of their courses the organization of their you know, you know the, of their, their year whatever it might be but it's to give people a sense of belonging absolutely uh, fantastic i'm gonna um i have to relinquish my, my right to ask you questions and go into to the audience questions now because we've got a good number of them uh, just to start off with a, a bit more of a technical one so this is from uh, cherry canavan uh, she said she'd like to ask susanna the following 
is it, of, uh, it is often the case that surveyors prefer not to ask what would you do questions because people can be poor at predicting their actions in certain circumstances. So did you address this issue in the report? How is that, uh, that taken into account? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to answer this one in detail because, as you say, it is slightly technical. Uh, so we also had a set of questions that were more self-report. So they were how likely would you be to do each course? And we report on those in the study as well, which I think fall more into the issue that you're talking about there. The theory with the conjoint experiment is because you're varying a lot of things at once, it's not obvious to people what has changed and therefore what your goal is that you're trying to measure uh, with each of the comparisons, because what you're looking at is basically on average across five tasks across 2,500 people. And so you're less concerned with people uh, reporting their preference inaccurately uh, as a result of that. Uh, but it's an inherent limitation of survey experiments. In this particular case, we decided not to use incentive compatible um, uh, pricing uh, outcomes. So we, we didn't try and incentivize accuracy or that sort of thing because it just didn't really seem like it was necessary with this form of experiment. But there is more detail on the method in the analysis report. And we have a detailed analysis report, don't we, for people who are interested in the detail. Okay, and we have a couple of questions on, on routes in, I suppose. So Cheryl Reynolds asks whether the panellists would like to comment on the importance of HE and FE. Um, and then we also have a question about uh, from Anthea, whose surname I can't see, um, says access courses have been mentioned. How much do the panel value them as a way in for mature learners? So any comments on access for, and FE routes in? Perhaps I'll go to John first. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the point about FE and HE and FE is that it tends to be local. And I think for many adult learners, they I, I, I think there's a bit of a, I'm not convinced particularly, forgive me, um, Susanna, about the research around uh, valuing um, high status universities, well, people would, wouldn't they? I think what adult learners want is something that's local, that they can get to within timescales that are suitable for them. And therefore, having HE in FE as a pathway is really, really important. Um, as director of an access program with 5,000 students a year on it, I'm greatly a fan of access programs. And I think it's important for adult learners in particular because students, uh, uh, adults lose so much confidence when they're out of education. I've, uh, and not only that, I've, I've spoken to people who are carrying with them the damage of a remark a teacher said to them about their quality of their work 40 years previously, four zero. People carry these um, albatrosses with them. And so I think what uh, access courses can do, and it's often if it's through a, in a local FE college or through a cohort, you're with other adult learners in very similar situations, which can be very supportive. But more importantly, I think they, they embed studentship skills and they in, inculcate that way of being a learner and we've certainly found that our, our students who take an access module, and it's not compulsory at the OU, um, the minority do. The minority who take an access course and then go on to the undergraduate study do about 10% better than students who go in directly. So basically they've learned to be a student, they've learned how to work with their tutor, possibly they've learned how to be a strategic learner. We can debate that separately, but I think they, these are. It, it's important, I think this notion of what does being prepared for undergraduate study look like? And for adult learners, often a bridging course helps. Thank you. Any other comments on that from either Stephen or Susanna? Access courses or FE? Um, yeah, can I, I um, <laughs> kind of respond briefly to John on the selective courses thing? Uh, I think the, first of all, I think we've got to be a bit careful about selectively disbelieving uh, components of a report like this. Uh, you know, if, if we kind of believe most of it, we need to think about why we don't believe one bit just because it's sort of inconsistent with our priors. I think the the other thing to say on, on that is that there were, all of them were valence issues. So all of them were things where you would expect people to like them. And so the question, or, or to dislike, you know, like shorter travel time, you expect people to like higher rankings, you expect people to like. And in many ways, it's the relativities between them that are interesting. And the fact that all else equal, people were much more strongly responsive to higher ranked institutions than we expected, I think is, is an interesting and pretty defensible finding of the report, uh, even, even if there are many other things that people also ranked very strongly. Uh, I, I mean, I think FE 
I, other than that, I completely agree with, with all of the comments. FE is immensely important, immensely underappreciated. Uh, the interface between HE and FE, uh, both in terms of uh, HE being uh, courses being taught in FE and people moving from FE to HE is, is just incredibly important to lifelong learning and to, and to this ecosystem. And I think one of the most uh, tragic and upsetting things that have happened in the education system in the last 10 years is the removal of funding from the FE system. Uh, and and, and it, it sh they should just have a lot more funding and a lot more support than they do to deliver the important work that they do. So just a follow up on FE, and we have an interesting uh, question here from Sarah Louise Collins, saying that very often because, um, as John mentioned, it's more difficult to reach adult learners, HEIs can fall back on looking to FE learners as a source of mature students. Um, what other avenues are there for looking for prospective mature students? And then Johnny Rich has a, a related question. Um, which is how can we encourage potential or uh, how can we encourage employers and trade unions in reaching mature learners? Because for employers, it can be threatening. It can be threatening to encourage staff to retrain or upskill. Um, and for trade unions, while they want to support their members' prospects, the first priority is to support them in their existing roles. So there's a tension there. Does the panel have any reflections on how we find our mature learners and then how we encourage uh, the actual progression into HE? Um, John, I can see you have it. You have a comment. Yeah, thank you. Re really good question. Um, I, I can speak on behalf of the Open University. We have a social partnership network, so we work work with lots of national providers, including uh, Union Learn, including the WEA, including some national disability charities, which have a, an educational focus. And I think probably what I'd really like to bring out today is the um, the potential in um, picking up students, as it were from informal learning through to kind of um, semi-formal learning, whatever one wants to call it, through to formal learning. And I think certainly we've found that uh, through our, our union learn links, offering students, for example, free short online courses, which had, um, you know, which were assessed and students got badges for them, um, uh, which, which they included in, in their kind of e-portfolio type approaches, um, certainly enabled students to take a, a start in their educational journey in a way that they were put off by the fees for conventional higher education. So that, that, uh, that, that aspect of having a taster of something for free and doing it in a very supportive way, for example, with, uh, with unions or with employers uh, would be one way in there. Thank you. Stephen, do you have any reflections on the best way of, of reaching out um, and finding these pools of learners who perhaps may, maybe didn't think about going to AG? Well, again, John just said it. I mean, we know where they are. I think um, certainly employers can look to, um, to upskill their stuff. I mean, one of the things, I work in prisons now, um, and um, one of the things is the fact that many prison officers actually um, don't have this highest level qualification many of them and it's a it's it, it can be problematic you know, if you're if you're in charge of a, a prisoner who just had his, just done his masters and um, so that, that whether whether you recognize you or not there is something you know going on in there so it, it, that's been recognized and indeed we're now trying to work with um the prison how much is this prison service to see Again, through the through the Open University, because again, the Open University does recognise these. So, so, so these are opportunities, and you can walk past. You know, they're, they're not necessarily being not necessarily um, advertised and publicised. That you, uh, you know, may not actually not that they're there, except except you work in that space and you're in that environment. But there are prison officers who um, who don't have the. Uh, these higher level qualifications and by uh, and by giving them access to it, by working with their employers and giving them access so that they're able to gain these qualifications as part of their day-to-day -day duties, um, then that, that's a win-win for everyone, everyone concerned. Because as a prisoner who is at university, I'd like my prison officer to have an understanding of what I'm trying to achieve. <laughs> you know, so this is, you know, I'm not you know, it's it's not just you know this is not GCSEs or whatever. These you know you're you're studying at a certain level, um, and that that um, involves you know certain responsibilities, certain tasks, and you need to be in an environment that understand what it takes to get a degree. You know, I mean, so that 
so that so that you can be better supported by people who know what's going on. If you you know if officers don't appreciate that it takes so long to write a five thousand word essay or whatever, um, then then you're just way at a loss because they they're not having any value to the acti what this activity that you're engaged in. So so it's important you can look at you can look at employ uh, employers can look to um, upskill their their employees, which will just obviously bring about a contribution to their whole organization. So you know so that's another way of, 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 of where you know where you when you're talking about looking to find mature mm -hmm. students, that's where you can find them. Growing with your staff. Um, this is a, a, a perhaps a related uh, question, so from uh, Tamara Reed, and we heard earlier today in some of our sessions about the role of, of um, HU providers reaching out into their community and the sense of a civic university. So do you think it's important that when it comes to engaging with adult learners that universities take up more of a role of civic partners with their local council and community organisations? And do you have any experience or best practice examples of that? Uh, John? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, well, yeah, what a great idea. And it feels like the time has come, frankly, with the move around civic responsibility of universities. There are, there are some great examples of universities already doing that. I will, I will give a call out to, for example, Wolverhampton, which is very embedded in its local community, has a high proportion of mature students and local learners. And indeed, in, uh, in many, many places, it's the, uh, if I may, it is the former polytechnics, the post-92 universities that seem much more um, open to this and recognise that there are, there are things they can do with their students and in relation to local industry as well, and in local upskilling and all those sorts of things. So um, uh, what I would say is yes, and the really clever ones have already got strong links with their local colleges and, uh, and with their local trades unions and, and are kind of doing a lot of this already, and it doesn't get reported very much. Uh, any reflection on oh, Susanna? I was going to say I completely agree and you can see that across HE and FE and workplace learning and sort of all, all of the domains of sort of adult and continuing learning, the organisations that are succeeding in reaching learners are the ones who are embedded in the community, working with local employers, working with local college, other colleges, working with community organisations, housing organisations, all of that sort of unglamorous on the ground legwork to find people understand what they need and provide it that's that that is you know notwithstanding the you know sort of need for evaluation on these things th those are the those are the models that are getting you know getting enrollments so that's great and um i think we have time for just one more question uh, before we finish on the hour and this is from Joanna McDonnell and, and looking forward, and this is a very timely question, how do HEIs balance the preferences of different groups of students in a post-pandemic landscape where mature students might prefer online or blended modes of learning compared to younger students who might be keen to get back to face-to-face -to -face campus experiences? Um, so very brief ref reflections from maybe um, all of you going to John, then Stephen, then Susanna. Okay, I'll start off by getting in something I didn't say, forgive me, which is about belonging. And I think, uh, I think universities can spend a lot of time worrying about belonging, and it's based on some quite old widening participation literature. The adults I've spoken to are less worried about belonging because, frankly, their student identity is one of about four or five. They're all wearing different hats as a parent and a worker and a carer and goodness knows what else. They just want universities that don't exclude them, which is not quite the same. So if, if we could get onto that, I think in terms of that kind of mixture of modes and uh, blending, I think that's going to happen automatically. I, I see, you know, and um, good good for them, and partly it's driven by the lockdown. I see far more universities investing significantly in good digital online approaches to study. And uh, I, I think open university students tell us that they, they loved it in the olden days when they used to come together for a day school or a, a meet with their tutor or whatever in their peer group. So I think that blending is already happening. Um, I, I think the key though, is that both aspects have to be of the highest possible quality. And I think the OU is advantaged in that they were designed 50 years ago to embed that. And I think other universities are having to add it on, which is not easy, but I think it is happening. Excellent, thank you. Stephen, any 30 second reflections on how we support your learners in the coming uh, years? Well, 
all I would say is when it comes to mature students, we think it's important to take the, lear the learning to them uh, and not expect them to come to us uh, because, you know, often, as, just, as, as John just alluded to, they have other responsibilities and commitment beyond their studies. So we, we're trying to make something possible um, as opposed to, so, we're, you know, if we're waiting for people to come to us, they might not come along. So if we can take it to them, and reach out to them, um, and just by doing that, I think I, I think the, the many would understand that. Yeah, you know it, it, that that is a positive thing to do, um, and that would be you know, that that would be that would be what I say. Yeah. Excellent, thank you, Stephen and Susanna. Any final reflections on the on that question, and particularly in light of the report? Oh, you're on mute. I managed, I got all the way through and then <laughs> fell over at the last hurdle. Uh, yes, it's going to be difficult. I don't envy the people in universities responsible for making these decisions about how to manage their sort of return to online or blended learning from a fully online model. Um, and I look forward to TESO in the fullness of time producing evaluation or guidance that can help universities do it more effectively. Excellent, thank you for the action there. <laughs> um, so we, we are now bang on three o'clock. I'm gonna wrap us up. Um, thank you so much to everyone for all their questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of them. Um, I hope you have a chance to look at our report. Thank you so much to John, Stephen and Susanna for their time and their insights. And I'm gonna hand back to Omar. Great, I nearly fell at the first hurdle with the muting. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so thank you all to all the, the panelists. Thank you to Eliza uh, for chairing. We now have another uh, 15 minute break as we have had previously. So for participants, uh, please stay on the line, but you've got 15 minutes before the next panel, which is the role that evidence plays in tackling uh, race equality gaps. But I wanna thank this panel again for an excellent discussion on mature learners, uh, which shows uh, how much further we've got to go. And I heard that call from uh, from all of them, but especially Suzanne at the end, that Tezos also got some work to do uh, to outline best practice for the future. Uh, many thanks again and see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>